Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are so excited to talk to Paul Johnson. If you guys are not aware, he just ran across the United States. So uh, quite a feat. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. We're excited to chat with you. Yeah, thanks for having me today. We are excited. We're going to dive into all things nutrition, wins, fails, who knows. We will learn from Paul today a bit about his experience there. Um, but as our listeners know, we're going to go straight to our two truths and a lie. Go ahead and break those down for us. All right. Um, I'm going to base these all from college. Okay. We're going to go back like seven years, six years. Um, let's see. I raised a service dog in college. Awesome. Um, I was an EMT in college. And I broke my leg in college. Ooh. Okay. These are all good. I feel like you might've been an EMT because I thought in our research, there's some Navy military, some background, maybe you needed an EMT for that. Don't tell us anything. <laughs> Holding this like stoic face, not even smirking or anything. Um, broke a leg is rough. I could see that happening too. And raising a service dog is rad. If you did that kudos to you, if you did that, um, I don't know. What do you think, Amanda? This one's tough. I'm going to say the broken leg is the lie just because I could see with the, um, you know, military service, maybe the service dog and the ENT thing kind of are in line with that. I'm going to go. He broke like a toe or something. I hope he, yeah. Hopefully it's not a broken leg. We will find out at the end. <laughs> he will reveal the answer. Um, awesome. Okay. Well, we will, we'll, we'll dive into those three or two truths and a lie at the end for you guys, our listeners, but why don't you take us back a little bit, Paul, and without revealing some of your truths or lies, um, how did you get into running? What, what got you excited and running very long distances? Um, I mean, I wasn't really into running all that much. Um, you know, you know, two years ago, um, I played soccer when I was younger, probably through like freshman year of high school. And then that was pretty much it. Um, I did maybe two years of triathlon in college. And then I think it was like my sophomore, junior year. And then I didn't do anything with it at all my senior year. Um, and then I went overseas to Spain immediately after for the Navy and I didn't really run much at all there either. Um, I would run maybe once, twice a week for like five miles. Um, obviously nowhere near where I'm at right now. And then it wasn't until it was what summer of 22 that I actually like started running. My One of my friends in San Diego, where I was at at the time, uh, wanted to run the Marine Corps Marathon. And he also wanted to try and qualify for Boston with it and, and go sub three hours. So I had run the Philadelphia marathon back in college when I was doing the triathlon stuff. So yeah, sure. I'll, I'll run it with you. Um, and then he kind of dropped the the bomb on me about trying to go th sub three. And so, you know, in about five months, we both kind of trained separately on our own and then went to Marine Corps, both got, both broke that sub three mark. And the rest is kind of history from there with jumping full force into the running. Wow. That's amazing. And did you, were you guys following a training plan? Were you just running together when you had the opportunity? Um, so he, he's a Marine. So he was up in Camp Pendleton. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit of distance between us. So we were training on our own. His, uh, I guess, his fiance now was training him. Oh, nice. And then I just Googled marathon training plan and whatever the Boston athletic association's free plans are. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm trying to go to Boston. So let's just, and I just followed one of those for great. five months. Awesome. That's great. And how did your body handle that and take to the like consistent running? Um, at first it was pretty rough. Like I remember the, second or third week when I had to run 30 miles for the first time, I thought my legs were going to snap in half. Um, it was, it was not fun. Everything hurt. 
and eventually it just got used to it. And I remember getting to 50 miles a week. And I'm like, this is incredible. I'm running so far. And then I think I peaked out around 65 miles or something. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, initially it was extremely difficult and it slowly got easier over time through that training cycle. Wow. And any injuries through that outside of, you don't have to tell us if you broke your leg, obviously. <laughs> um, no, no injuries during, during that nice. training. That's awesome. And, um, how were you taking care of your body? Were you doing any mobility, stretching, massage? I'm the world's worst stretcher. I never stretch. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, my, yeah, my coach now hates me because I don't stretch. I don't know. I just, I just don't do it. Um, yeah. Now, the only other thing would be like, I think what's a little bit different from what I do to, I think, you know, typical runners who are super into the sport is I actually do a lot of lifting in the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, so I probably go for, um, an hour and a half, about three times a week. Nice. And it's not like I'm focused on how do I strengthen my leg or how do I strengthen, you know, my IT bands or flexibility. It's more just like, I just go and I try to pick up heavy things and, and that's what I enjoy. I, I'm by no means a bodybuilder, but you know, I just enjoy going to the gym and, and trying to move around a lot of weight. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, strength training is um is important, of course, for our longevity too. That piece is is going to be beneficial, keeping the bones strong. Um, so with this big feat you just did, um, there's also a documentary coming out. I that can can you tell us a little bit about what is this big feat you just did, and um, and what like what drew you to to taking this on? Yeah, so uh, the run across America, it's you know notionally you got to cover the distance between los angeles city hall and new york city hall which is something like 2700 miles across the u.s um that's the minimum standard but within the running community you've you've got to do like you got to do 3000 at least so i'm like i'm not going a mile further i'm going to do 3000 exactly um and yeah that's what we did we ran speed walked power hiked crawled Mm -hmm. um all the way across the United States in about uh, 51 days and three hours. So we we're oh my gosh, just a touch under 60 miles a day. Oh um, my gosh. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, a lot of pain. Um, it's much more fun now that it's done. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, and we're trying to do a couple things with it. Um, obviously, just the challenge and the chance to get to experience that and attempt that um, not many people have gotten to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were looking at trying to see how fast we go. If, you know, maybe we can try to tackle the world record. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't quite work out. Um, world records right around 42 days. Gosh. Um, finished, you know, nine days after that, we did slow down our pace at the end to, to time it to end on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I think if we had kept what we were doing, we probably could have hit f- just under 50, like 49 and 20 hours or something. But, um, still really happy with the, with the time still really fast. Um, and then the third component, which is the most important part for us is, um, the raising awareness for mental health and attempting to fundraise a million dollars for team red, white, and blue. Wow. That's amazing. And with the fundraising component, can people still donate? Absolutely. The, um, the site's still up and active. The links are all still active. I think, Last I checked, we're right around six hundred thousand dollars. Wow! So we're at we're at half a million at the finish. I think we're up to six hundred thousand now, um, and we're still we're still gunning for that million dollars by the end of the year, which is something that's going to be tied to the documentary that you had mentioned. Amazing. Well, we will put the link um, to the red team, red, white, and blue, in the show notes for our listeners. If you guys want to check that out and contribute to the cause, and um, and the documentary comes out fall. Fall. Um, I think, I think we're looking to have it finished last week of September or first week of October. Amazing. Um, the plan is there's a couple film festivals that we're looking to submit it to. And then we're also looking to do um, some private screenings in LA and New York before we go um, public with it. Cool. Awesome. Well, we will keep that on our radar. Certainly. I, 
I saw the like trailer, little trailer clip for it. Yeah. And then it looks like it's going to be really good. That would be a good one come fall too. If someone's doing any indoor treadmill runs, motivation right there, put that on your, <laughs> keep, keep yeah, that I mean, on it, It's screen. funny enough when I was doing my treadmill runs um, last year, I would literally watch videos of people who have already done transcons and kind of like mm. their summaries of it. So you know, yeah. now someone else can do that with mine. Amazing. Very cool. And so 51 days, 60 miles a day to me, that sounds like, holy smokes. Um, were you sleeping and how much <laughs> and when? Um, so I was, I was doing about four to five hours a night. And then oh my gosh. I would take three seven minute naps throughout the morning and a 20 minute nap sometime in the afternoon. Whoa. Is this something you learned from the Navy out of curiosity? Are you allowed to share um, that? <laughs> I mean, I think most people in the military are just used to operating on very little sleep. Um, it definitely takes a toll. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, personally, like, at home, I don't sleep well either. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even on my day to day, I probably average about four to five hours a night. Wow. Um, so with that regard, I guess I was kind of used to it, but mm -hmm. you still have the the physical um, load that you're dealing with. Yeah. Nothing like my normal life. Yeah. So absolutely dragging a lot more. And that's where those kind of micro naps were really crucial to keeping us moving. Yeah. Wow. So when you would go put your head down at night, did you just like fall right asleep or was your body so elevated from the consistent stress and movement all day that it was hard to sleep? Uh, there were a couple of nights that it was pretty tough. Um, most of the time, I'm just like constantly waking up like every 30 minutes throughout the night. Wow. Uh, but we had a pretty good setup where I would only be out for 15 hours a day. So from the time I start running example, five 30 in the morning, mm -hmm. um, we stop running at eight 30 PM. So our 15 hour mark. And then that would give me two hours to decompress till 10 30. And then a six hour window from 10 30 to four 30. Um, that was, you know, my dedicated sleeping window. Wow. And so do you have someone following you with like an RV and like, how does that work? Are you coordinating hotels? Like, how do you, do uh, we're, li we're living out of an RV. So it's a crew okay. of about four. Um, so we had the RV and then we also had like a camper van. Mm. Um, and so the crew and all of their things were based out of the RV. And then I was slept in the van. That's kind of where I existed and lived. And the van did most of the crewing throughout the day. So the RV could take care of whatever chores had to be done. Um, and sometimes they crewed out of the RV, just depending what was going on. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. So we have to talk about nutrition. I'm just like, so cur <laughs> curious. How do you, I, I saw you did, I think a before and after from a, like you did a photo of a before and after and yep. like, so, it seems like over 51 days and running 60 miles a day, there was a three pound weight change. Is that what I saw? Yeah. So I started starting weight was 175 pounds. Um, finish weight was 172. So I only lost three, but during the run at the halfway mark, I was down 13 pounds. I was down oh, wow. to one, was it 162 ish somewhere in there. Um, wow. and so we we're actually able, like, if you look at some of the videos of me from the middle or yeah, from the middle of the race, you can definitely tell it's like, I've got no more butt on me. Like mm. my, my tights kind of look more like loose pajamas type of thing in some areas, like my quads and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we were able to actually get some of that weight back as we were moving towards the finish. Wow. Did you happen to do DEXA scans or like body comp before and after? No, I didn't. That would be interesting. I kind of wish see. I did. Yeah. To see like, I mean, you, obviously you can see it and feel it, but like how much muscle was, you know, and where did it move to throughout the body to or lose from? Um, so interesting. Okay. So how are you fueling yourself for 60 miles a day? Uh, we're doing daily. We're doing about 10 to 12,000 calories. Wow. Um, we're not like scientifically tracking it. And, you know, this label says a hundred type of thing. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, we would like tally it up for the day and kind of see where we're at. Um, but most of the time it was just like, Hey, we know we roughly need to eat this 
you know, amount of food. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, 10 to 12,000 calories a day. Essentially the plan was from the second I wake up till dinner time at 9 PM, I was basically being fed every 10 to 15 minutes. Wow. Um, just so that we could constantly get food through the body. Um, cause if I, if I sit down and try to eat three or four massive meals, I'm just not gonna be able to get all those calories in, in that sitting. So we just opted for continuous eating throughout the day and in, in order to be able to stomach all that. Nice. And so what kind of foods were you eating that, and, and also did you feel like those worked well for you or did you have to adapt or change any of those? Were you getting flavor fatigue or GI issues? Um, flavor fatigue was definitely kind of an issue. Um, I think we did okay with it. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a lot of Oreos, pancakes, um, mac and cheese, steak, wow. um, gushers, fruit roll-ups, donuts. Um, what else? Ice cream. Um, it was a lot of the main stuff. Yeah. But, um, I, there's definitely some, some GI issues with it. Um, you know, just with number one, just the sheer number of food that's going into my body that I have to out process, you know, I basically have to use the bathroom like four times a day just to get expel everything out of my body. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times it's, it's not quite diarrhea, but it's like definitely very soft. Um, and there's just definitely a lot of gas in the body. Mm. Um, and you know, while that's an issue, I still think it did really well. Um, just because I'm able to very quickly have those fuel sources mm -hmm. and they're very easy to do while on the move. Um, and that's a lot of what I use for my other races too. Yeah. Um, and, and I haven't had GI issues. So I think it's just, it's a whole combination of things, but in the end, I think it works pretty well for us. Yeah. Wow. And thinking about that caloric demand that you need to support that effort, is that a volume that you've ever consumed before? No, I mean, even in my training, when I was doing in like the kind of the peak weeks of training, I was doing uh, about three days of 40 miles, a uh, three days where I was doing 40 miles each. Wow. Uh, so those would be like my biggest days. And those I was doing about 8,000 calories. Wow. Um, but I was eating those in mostly large meals. Mm -hmm. And it was fine. Yeah. Um, so that was probably the most that I had done beforehand. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. I imagine that in and of itself is like your digestive system just having to process 4,000 more calories than you've ever consumed before is another stress, right? Yeah. Um, were you using any like sports nutrition products that you liked or felt like helped? Um, not, I mean, we were using, we were using Tailwind um, for electrolytes and, and be mm -hmm. able to drink some of the calories. Um, we used another brand called Redmond, mm -hmm. uh, which was a lot of electrolyte as well. Yeah. Um, some salt tabs. I use a, um, I use a pre-workout actually for my caffeine. So mm -hmm. I don't like coffee at all. Um, and I find that the pills, caffeine pills don't seem to affect me as much. Oh, interesting. Um, so we had, you know, had that a couple times throughout the day, but mm -hmm. that's really it. Wow. Do you ever do the run gum stuff, the caffeinated run gum? Um, one of the crew members gave it to me to try and I hated it. Yeah. It, the flavor <laughs> I don't is like, like, I don't even like gum. So. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like fake calories at the end of the day. Um, and then, so you said tailwind for some electrolytes. Um, and then what is, what, like, were you trying to do a race morning, like not race morning? Well, I guess, I mean, you could call it race. Yeah. But like, what was your morning breakfast? Was it the same thing every day or were you switching it up or? Yeah, it was, um, I don't know, 12, 20 ounces of like overnight oats. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and the, the pre-workout and then we would go from there and immediately start hitting, um, the first three hours of the day would basically, we call them calorie bombs, but it's basically Oreos cooked inside of pancakes. Oh, and so gosh. I would, they would just hand me those and I would just eat them while we're going every you know, 10, 15 minutes. Wow. 
That's impressive. You should, you should enter like a, um, a hot dog eating competition or something. <laughs> I feel like you'd be able to like do really well. Um, and then what was the end of the day nutrition looking like? Like, what did you, as soon as you finished, what was the first thing you took down? Um, it was typically mac and cheese and like, like cut up, like not like good steak, but steak. Mm -hmm. Um, so I basically eat a whole container of like Stouffer's mac and cheese, um, like a family size container of that for myself, plus steak. And then I'd probably eat anywhere from like, it wasn't every night, but usually like half a pint of ice cream, probably mm -hmm. half the time. Wow. Um, and that was typically, that was typically what dinner looked like. Wow. Well, that's great. Yeah. Calories. You got to get the calories in. So through that process, kind of when you're first starting out, did you... Like, what was your motivation and, and mental aspect initially? I mean, did you have this kind of like feeling good going in? And was there like a certain day in that you had that fatigue, like load up on you at all? Or question what you were doing? Any of that I mean, I could question what we were doing every single morning, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even at the end. Um, yeah, the, the first hour of the day is the, like the roughest point mm. of all the just the cold, dark, Mm. sickness of the body the tired it's just yeah not a fun morning every time um and definitely a lot of questioning like what we're doing mm. but in terms of kind of like the feeling throughout the race and the run um you know day four is when we decided that we weren't going to try to push the record with the pace because we you know our goal going in was just to see if we could do 75 miles a day for 40 days wow. which i was not in i was not quite in the condition for that and um you know, we took a lot of gambles with our course, the time of year, a lot of things that are different from how most people run the transcon when they're trying to go for the record. Mm. Uh, and we knew that. And, you know, day two, we got caught in a, like a sandstorm for about uh, four hours. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there's a video on my Instagram somewhere towards the beginning of the run where, you know, it's just like 50 mile per hour winds ripping through and me wow. and all the crew members like we can't even see we're just trying to navigate off the little line on my watch wow uh, so that was rough because i ended up not being able to like swallow or talk for yeah. about a week with that so that was a huge issue going into days three and four because i just i couldn't get enough calories in like i couldn't mm -hmm. swallow and eat food um literally to get enough salt in my body they opened up a salt tablet had me lean back and tried to like dump it down my throat because I couldn't like swallow the salt pill. Um, okay. and I, I couldn't get these electrolytes into my body. Oh. So that coupled with the heat of the desert, which I'm not used to running in being in the Northeast, um, definitely into like heat exhaustion symptoms. And, you know, on day four, we're like, you know, we're not gonna be able to sustain this. Mm. Uh, you know, I basically would have to sleep 30 minutes a day and that's it type of thing. Yeah. Uh, I would beat the cruise beats are like, all right, we're, we're just going to go back to trying to finish this thing. Um, so that was definitely a very tough moment um, just, you know, physically. And then a lot of injuries popping up, like my mm -hmm. ankle, my feet um, and come day 10, we were getting into Flagstaff, Arizona. And I was basically hopping on one foot for 15 miles that morning. Cause I couldn't put any weight on my I think it was my right foot wow and um luckily we had a uh, some friends out there Pete Kostelnik who's the current record holder he was out running with us for a bit um he got one of his PT friends to come out and mm -hmm. he yanked on my ankle a bunch and did some things and all of a sudden I was able to like bear weight on it and I was good to go wow uh, so that day 10 was like couldn't barely walk to all of a sudden now I'm able to run sub 10 minute miles again and then still dealing with a bunch of pain and things like that. But on day 16 or 17 is like the first time that I started running you know, relatively pain-free. I mean, the whole body hurts and is sore, but not like that ankle type of pain. Um, and pretty much from 16 on forward, I never had any major, um, you know, like physio injuries. Wow. Um, so definitely day, day four was a big mark day 10 and that day 16 17 as well wow that's incredible the sandstorm thing yeah um yeah plant weather is such a tricky thing you know you you don't know what you're gonna get and sometimes you forget 
what kind of things can even happen and hit you in certain areas. Um, but a sandstorm, were you even thinking about that as a possibility? I mean, not really. Cause it was yeah. too, we're, li <laughs> we're leaving like LA suburbs and trying to roll into Palm Springs in California, um, you know, from one city to the other. And we're running, we're like, wow, that looks like a lot of sand. That looks like it sucks. And it's the way we're going. And then sure enough, it, it sucked. Yeah. And, um, they actually shut down our the road that we use whenever they have those bad sandstorms. Mm -hmm. So we had to reroute like 12 miles additional through Palm Springs and then oh. cut back on the other side. So yeah, it was just, it was not expected. I didn't even think about that as a possibility. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, I mean, the gear, well, yeah. Do you wear like ski goggles? or like, I don't know, <laughs> and a COVID mask? Like, how do you get around that? That's hard. Um, what other kind of weather did you run into? I mean, you mentioned the heat, obviously. Were you able to do like ice socks or like cooling in any way, like water on you or? Um, yeah, so we did um, that day, I think it was day three. Um, in all truth, we had hotter days in it was somewhere else i think it was like indiana or kansas or like we had hotter days there than we did in the desert in california <laughs> um but just being in that desert environment was just rough yeah. um so we would i had like a, a white um kind of loose shirt with a hood that we would just soak that in water mm -hmm. um they had sponges that they soaked in ice water and would kind of squeeze them over me every mile or so. Wow. Um, and then we eventually shifted to just not running from like noon to 5 p.m., mm. which we should have probably done from the beginning mm. um, rather than trying to run straight through the day all, all the time. But mm -hmm. lessons learned. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the peak heat there. Um, that's really incredible. Did you ever do any like sweat testing or sweat sodium testing before this to know kind of targets to shoot for? No, again, another great <laughs> idea that we should have done <laughs> beforehand. Um, it's funny. I'm, I'm starting to do some of that now, um, nice. with some individuals, um, I know with, uh, that, that work in New York. So I'm actually getting all like metabolic rate, mm -hmm. uh, sweat testing, awesome. getting all that information. Um, probably this weekend. So it'll be good. Amazing. Yes. That, that plays a big role. Did you have any like muscle cramping or anything like that go on throughout? Um, the cramping, I think is more just, um, not so much cramping, but just use mm -hmm. pains, um, in like the glutes mm. and the hip flexors. Um, I didn't really have any cramping issues until actually after we were finished mm. in New York and like laying in the hotel bed for pretty much two days straight. Wow. And anytime I would like stretch out my body, like when you're laying in bed, and you're like really stretching out your feet. Yeah. I would get these massive cramps in the bottom of my arch actually. Oh. Um, yeah. And a couple of times it just came up without me even trying to stretch out a bit. Wow. Um, other than that, that probably lasted for about three days, but that's about the other only cramps I think I experienced. Man, that's incredible. I mean, really amazing. And so how did you, like, what, what did you do to take care of your body once you were done? What, like, um, light movement? Foot massage. That sounds nice. Yeah. The, uh, we call him Dr. Magic Mike. Um, <laughs> YouTube educated. So he, um, he gave me like a 20 minute foot massage every night right before bed. Oh, and that's like the only really recovery. Yeah, I did. We had we had um, we had like those compression boots. I wasn't a mm. huge fan of them. Yeah, Um, I, I probably used those a total of maybe 10 times, mm. but like without fail, every single night was the foot massage. And I think that was the biggest thing for me in helping out. That's great. Did you implement in any like supplements, beta alanine, creatine, omegas, like anything um, like that throughout? At some point, they started feeding me all these force pills. Um, and def it was like, I don't know, 20 pills at dinner that they're feeding me every night. And wow. some of those, some of those words sound familiar. Honestly, I have no idea. Um, and even <laughs> now they get mad at me because they're like, are you taking a daily vitamin? I'm like, no, I, I'm not like, I just, 
I don't know. I just run and eat, ca- drink caffeine and, and eat food. Wow. Um, so they, they started giving me a bunch of stuff like that. I just don't mm-hmm. remember entirely what it all was. Wow. That would Pre- be incredible to run yeah. like a full nutrient analysis, like on your <laughs> daily intake and see what, where things were at. I mean, a lot of times when athletes are consuming that many calories, like you end up, even if it's from mac and cheese and, you know, stuff like that, it's like you ec- actually end up hitting a lot of your vitamin and mineral targets because you have such a high caloric intake that it's hard to not. So you're probably in a, in a good place overall, but yeah, from a inflammation and just like tissue stress, but those maybe they, hopefully they fed you some omegas because that probably would, <laughs> would help a um, bit uh, there. I know there was like a fish oil pill. Yeah. Fish oil. Mm-hmm. That's great. So, um, one kind of last question on the, the race itself. Um, how did you stay motivated to keep going? <laughs> um, I don't think you really can stay motivated. Like yeah. you're just, you're not going to stay motivated. Um, I think I kind of talk about this in, in another interview I did and it's that like, I think for everyone has their own reason, mm. um, kind of why they're doing, if you look at all the people who have done something like the transcon, um, you don't just go out and do it. Um, because you know, it's going to suck. It's going mm. to hurt. Like it's going to be a miserable experience. Um, like a lot of endurance sports are. And so for me, I think it was more so my view of it is if I don't finish this thing, I'm letting a lot of people down. Not so much that the, um, you know, people are upset that we didn't get, keep going for the record, whatever. I don't really care about that because that wasn't the, the overall goal. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially seeing like the level of people that came out to support us in, you know, there's towns in Ohio and Missouri where the entire town is out on the street as we're going by like a parade Aww. or, we ran past um, a middle school in uh, Illinois and also Pennsylvania. And the whole school let out so that all the kids could like stand on the street as we went by. And like the elementary school, they were running along the fence line with us as we went by. Um, you know, seeing that level of support, seeing um, the people who came out to run with us and shared some of their experiences and, and how much this run meant to them. I honestly feel like the run you know, while it means, while it's cool to me and it means a lot, I don't think it meant as much to me as it did to other people. Mm. And they weren't even the ones running, but the fact that it was happening meant a lot to them. Um, And so it's in that sense that it's like, I, I, I want so badly to stop and to quit. But at that point, I feel like I'm letting down all these people who are so heavily invested in it. And I think that was one of the biggest driving factors for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. It is. I mean, from my perspective, I have not run across the United States, let alone 60 miles in a given day. So it's just, it is incredible to see what the human body can do. And it just, yeah, I feel like it opens up people's, um, I don't know, like perspectives of themselves and maybe potential, like you can do things like that, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty incredible. So, um, what is on the like radar for you in the future are you going to take on any other are you going to run around the world like what's next um you know we're, we're, rob my crew chief and i are actually been working pretty diligently the last week kind of you know, figuring out what what this future looks like um there's some other continents in consideration right now um mm. uh we're looking at uh some stuff in antarctica we're looking at some stuff in europe and asia wow uh, and then also some smaller projects um, that we're finalizing some details on, but there's, there's definitely a lot more to come. Amazing. Wow. That, that'll be incredible. And hopefully some more fun documentaries we get to, to watch and, and get Absolutely. all motivated by. Um, okay. So I will, I'll, I'm going to move on to our listener questions um, so we can make sure we, we get to those. Um and I shared with you before we hit record. So just so our fangirls who wrote in know, I did tell Paul that the fangirls wrote in. So he's got a fangirl crowd. <laughs> um, but our real questions here. Um, this one, the first one is, 
what was the best fuel you used during, well, this just says best fuel during a run. Is there during a training run you like, um, any things? Um, I'm a huge fan of ice cream. Um, that's more of like, more of like a post run thing. Mm -hmm. Um, fruit roll-ups and gushers were pretty big. Like any, every time the crew fed me, they just kind of came out and handed me what they thought I should have at the time. Mm. And anytime I saw them holding gushers, like my face just lit up. Um, <laughs> that or what worked really well was actually the donuts. Oh yeah, um, you know, like those powdered mini donuts you can buy mm -hmm. in a bag at a grocery store. I was eating three of those bags a day for wow. the donuts. And then if I passed like a Dunkin' Donuts, we would get two dozen glazed donuts, and I'd eat both boxes in like just the morning or just the afternoon. Wow. That's incredible. Gosh. <laughs> so put that on your, your radar, uh, listener. Um, okay. And then next one we have here is, do you currently work with a coach or do you do your own program? It sounds like you do work with a coach, right? Yeah, we, um, I work with a coach. He's not, um, he's not an ultra coach at mm. all. Like I'm the only, he's, he's mostly triathlon and marathon. Mm. Um, we connected through the Navy. He's actually the Navy marathon team coach Wow, That's uh, for awesome. their, for their, um, for the all Navy team that competes with, you know, the other services. Wow. Um, I am not fast enough to be on that team, but you know, he and I work together, um, you know, separately and it's, it's more of a collaboration between us because he doesn't have the ultra racing experience, but he has the programming and the coaching and the, Hey, don't be an idiot doing this type of experience. Yeah. Uh, so it's really kind of a, a mutual collaboration between us on what that programming looks like. Nice. Awesome. Does he do your gym stuff too, programming, or do you have that kind of name? No, I, I do that on my own. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And then next one was, um, in the leading up to the transcon, did you do any, uh, they're saying running mechanics, um, training, it sounds like. Um, the own, not leading, like not in the specific, like five month block, five, four or five month block leading into the transcon, but probably about nine months prior, 10 months prior, the summer leading into it. Um, you know, I was really in like the middle of my race season for ultras and we were really trying to work on in making my stride more efficient. Mm. Uh, if you look at if you look at a video of me running from uh, a year and a half ago versus a video of me running today, there's a you know, significant difference. And just mm. now my body is people always make fun of me. Cause like my wrists are like, they look like a T-Rex, like my wrists are <laughs> flopping around when I'm running. Um, but you know, we've actually gotten extremely efficient with the arms and the legs. Hmm. Um, but those mechanics we sort of worked on, before getting into the actual training. That's cool. I'm not as versed in running as I am in cycling, but I know with cycling, you know, there's all like certainly arrow and like the, the levels of arrow and the skin suits and the helmet and the, you know, positioning and your power, like all that stuff can get little, like little incremental improvements there. Um, with the, the arm efficiency, what is that? What does that look like? Is the, are the arms and wrists like more stiff or like, what can make you more efficient? Um, I mean, the biggest thing for the arms is trying to keep like your bicep and your forearm at a very small, like acute angle. Mm. Like you see, like kind of like when you think of like arms tight to the chest, mm -hmm. um, you know, the example I always give people is, is chips to nips. Like you have to pretend that you're holding a potato chip and you're rubbing it on your nipples while you're running. Like that's where your hands <laughs> <laughs> be yeah. uh, because the more you extend your arm it's like holding a big rock and yeah the further you hold it away from your body the more energy you're spending to swing it around so um fascinating so being able to keep those arms close to the body and that that angle of your elbow bit much smaller is really big for just how much energy you're using <laughs> over a very long period of time yeah yeah that makes sense that makes sense. Wow. Yeah. All the little things like, and then it makes, that makes me think of, did you ever hear about the speedo swimsuit that they had to ban? Um, I knew there was like 
some illegal spe- uh, swimsuit, but I didn't know why. But it's basically that. It's like it helped them. I think it helped them become more buoyant, which allowed them to utilize less oh, energy. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, all of these things and like the super shoes and all that stuff, right, is like they're just trying to minimize, you know, little bits of energy output to help give you more to continue on, which, yeah. So we're all, we're always tweaking, fine tuning stuff. Um, Okay. And then... Let's see. I think we kind of talked about it. It says uh, calories you were burning each day. And is it difficult to keep up with that? Um, how in the world do you support um, that big diet necessity? <laughs> um, I think we um, kind of covered that, but any add-ons to that question? Yeah. The people ask like, what was the hardest part? Um, the hardest part is honestly eating enough food every day. Yeah. Um, like the crew's literally, I know we got in an argument one night because they kept like trying to get me to eat more. And I'm like, I don't want to eat anymore. Yeah. Um, and like we literally got in a shouting match with each other. And I just like left and I went into the van and like locked the door so they couldn't like get to me. And I'm yeah. like, <laughs> I'm just sick of eating food. But yeah, you know, in the end, I suffer from that the next day because I don't have calories. So that was one of the toughest parts was eating everything every day. Yeah. Yeah. What was your appetite like after you finished? still pretty massive um you know it's it's weird trying to find the balance of my body's screaming at me because it's hungry and it wants food but i don't have that caloric demand all of a sudden right but it's also the point of i do need higher calories because my body's trying to repair itself so it's like dancing on that line of starving myself but not starving myself and i don't need the calories but i do need some level of calories so it's definitely kind of weird for two weeks yeah. Yeah, certainly. And I imagine too, like with that caloric intake, even though it's from calorically dense foods, I mean, you're stretching your stomach out to some extent that's expecting a similar volume, uh, even though you're not putting that output out. So yeah, pretty incredible. Um, okay. So those were our listener questions. I'll, I'll circle back to our two truths and a lie. So you had said you raised a service dog in college, you were an EMT in college and that you broke your leg in college. And we are thinking the broken leg was a lie. Which one was the lie? Is the broken leg. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I've broken, if you count a stress fracture, I've broken my leg. Um, actually, when I ran the Marine Corps Marathon that first time, I broke oh, it. Like wow. I like stress fractured it like the week before. Oh, um, no. But in, but also in college, I got hit by a car when I was cycling for like the triathlon stuff. I oh, uh, ended up like fracturing, you know, my, my scaphoid and my, my thumb or whatever. Oh, so shoot. Two different yeah. periods, two different injuries. Yes. Okay. Well, tell us about this service dog. I'm very curious to hear about this. <laughs> um, it was as simple as we wanted to have a dog and no hmm. college apartment lets you have dogs. So the only way you can do that is if it's a service dog, we didn't have the, if I tried to get some sort of like doctor's note, then the Navy would have kicked me out because they're like you're medically disqualified um so like the only way to do it is to train a service dog and our school had a program that did that oh wow um, so we applied and my roommate and i got to raise a dog for two years from like eight weeks old um oh. so and then we got to take it around to class and you know take it out to dinner and things like that and have a that's good time great. oh that sounds amazing gosh are you, do you want to shout out your college? <laughs> uh, Penn State. Okay. Because that is a rad program. I feel like other colleges should get on board with that. Also, yeah. service dogs are just rad. Was it a service dog for the blind? Do you know what kind of service, like what the service um, was? It depends. So like <laughs> they, you know, they breed their dogs specifically for like their temperament and intelligence and things like that. But then they you go through about the two years or so. Um you know, probably around whatever age they do the neutering at, they mm. make a decision whether or not they're going to use that dog to breed or not. Mm. Um, and then after around the two year mark, they do, they start going through some of their basic testing to figure out how they're going to fit in. Um, so like our dog, we knew he, he didn't make it as a service dog just because he gets way too excited around other dogs. Oh yeah. But I think they ended up placing him like working in a school with kids or something. Oh, so like it's awesome. not necessarily specifically for someone who may be blind. Mm-hmm. Um, so many other things like, you know, someone living with 
uh, a wheelchair or a walker or mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things that the dogs can do. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly like the emotional support dogs too is a big thing. So yeah, I can see, I can see that. That's amazing. And then EMT in college, was that something that you, did you get your EMT in college or you worked as an EMT in college? Um, both. So there was actually like a four credit class that you did all your EMT work and then it's an automatic A as long as you pass the exam. Nice. So I was like, I'll do this because I wanted, I've been wanting to do it for a while. Um, and then once I got in, I got certified. Then I worked for the city for about a year and a half uh, on the truck. Wow. That's awesome. Are we talking about like a fire truck or? Uh, kind of ambulance. Oh, wow. Cool. That's awesome. And then I'm sure that came in handy for the Navy. Um, or no? Not really. Oh. Um, <laughs> at least not not for what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I mean, the skills, some of the skill sets still apply. And, you know, I'm before the Navy, I'm used to not getting a lot of sleep. Mm. Uh, but other than that, it was more like a lot of fun to do and keep yeah. myself busy and a little extracurricular. Yeah. Awesome. Are you still involved in the Navy? currently or are you primarily focused on running right now um yeah so i'm still active duty navy um i did three years on a ship in spain right after commissioning i did a year and a half in san diego and then i've been here in newport rhode island for uh, just over a year now so i have about nine months or so left in the navy before i'll separate wow. uh, and then hopefully i can focus more of my energy on running yeah. Wow. Amazing. So I take you don't get seasick then. Uh, not really. No, I mean, there's a couple of times where it's just, it's rough enough with the seas that everybody's kind of not feeling good. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, I'm fine. Wow. That's yeah. That's good for you. Kudos to that. <laughs> I need, I need a scalpamine patch like every time. Um, okay. So we'll tie it up here. I want to be mindful of your time. Where can our listeners find you, follow you? Where can they find, well, I guess we don't know yet where the documentary is going to come out to after the, but where can they find you and follow you? Yeah. So I'm most present on Instagram. Um, it's just Paul Johnson, but instead of an L it's an I. So it's Powie Johnson. Um, same thing with YouTube, um, same handle. And then if they're looking for more information about um, you know, what we could accomplish with the transcon and everything else, it is all linked on our event page, which is at pauljohnson.run. Um, awesome. All right. Well, we will link that for the listeners in the show notes. And thank you again so much for joining us, Paul. This has been fascinating. Yeah. Thanks for having me.